welcome to episode 15 of the OGV Media Group Let's Talk Transition series of podcasts. I'm Murray Melhuish, the founder and principal consultant at Annet Consulting. We help organisations bring offshore technologies and services to market and provide interim project management for the offshore wind industry. I'm delighted to have with me today Kieran Ivers, the Chief Executive Officer of Green Rebel Group. Hey Kieran, thanks for joining us. Hi, Murray. Good, glad to be here. Delighted. Can you introduce yourself and your business, please? Sure. Yeah. Um, so um, my name is Kieran Ivers. I'm the CEO of uh, Green Rebel Group. Uh, Green Rebel is actually a collection of of companies who are kind of like a, a mini conglomerate. Uh, Green Rebel was established just over two years ago um, in Ireland uh, to service the offshore wind uh, industry. Um, Given the state of where Ireland is at right now, we're at the DevX phase in terms of the life cycle of offshore wind. So Green Rebel uh, is focused primarily on data acquisition and data processing uh, for the you know, to inform developers during the consenting process, data that helps, um, you know, judge environmental impacts, but also influence and give uh, d- data on um, on engineering design of their wind farm. So as of today, uh, there are actually four key areas to our business. Uh, so we have a marine team and we operate a number of survey vessels. Uh, typically, they would be used for geophysical surveys um, on proposed wind farm sites. So. Uh, we have a team who operate a number of vessels, our flagship vessel being the Roman Rebel. It's a, a 35 metre vessel and then scaling down to a number of inshore vessels down to a number of ribs. So each of those vessels has a number of different purposes. Um, some are further offshore than others. Uh, typically, uh, we will drive the demand for those vessels internally uh, with our own geophysics team. But we also are active in the charter market, uh, supporting other um, developers or supporting other service providers in that area. Uh, so I alluded to we have a geophysics uh, team as well. So we have a, a service unit, uh, both onshore and offshore uh, scientists who will go uh, on our vessels and acquire uh, the data. Once that data is acquired uh, on a proposed wind farm, it then comes ashore. And we have a team at Green Rebel who will do the necessary processing and interpretation and provide reports uh, to teams within offshore wind farm developers. Uh, so that's a, a very interesting part and a very uh, heavy uh, science lift for what we do. Uh, we also have a aerial ecology team. So again, uh, at the early stages in the DevX phase, um, certainly in the UK and Ireland, uh, the technique of aerial based ecology is prominent. So uh, we operate a number of airplanes out of Cork Airport here in Ireland, and uh, we do that baseline ecology, basically assessing uh, birds, migratory patterns, mammals uh, and other uh, objects on the seabed. So that's a 24 month process. Again, we have a team of scientists that will take the data, literally seven terabytes of data, 25,000 images per site, which need to be processed, which need to be eyeballed, um, and ultimately end up in a report that typically goes into an environmental impact assessment. Um, Our other part of our business, it was done through an acquisition early in our uh, evolution. Uh, We acquired a company, a Limerick company in Ireland called IDS Monitoring. So they uh, are a company with over 25 years experience in in the Med Ocean area. So effectively measuring water quality, uh, waves and currents. But through some innovation, uh, we also developed a a platform uh, called a floating LIDAR platform, uh, which effectively uh, helps wind developers quantify the wind resource, which again uh, informs ultimately the price um, and how much output they can get from the wind that's there, but which then informs um, uh, engineering design. So that's a really um, key part of our business uh, with a a real international appeal. So we run that business out of Limerick City, uh, just north of us here in Cork. and then we also have uh, another department, which is Green Rebel Hubs. So Green Rebel owns quite a large amount of property within Cork Harbour, which uh, over the next 10, 20 years will no doubt be a hub for offshore wind energy. So looking at that life cycle of offshore wind and looking at the opportunities, maybe more the OPEX opportunities uh, for use of that 20 acres. Uh, so currently they're working boat yards and warehousing facilities, but you know, looking at our brand and looking at how we evolve our brand and extend our brand in the future. Um, that's kind of a, another project we're working on. So quite busy uh, down here in Cork in Ireland. Great. And you, you've been in business two years, did you say? Yes, uh, Green Rebel was founded uh, end of 2020 uh, when the country was in the throes of a, a COVID pandemic. Um, it was 
uh, founded by a visionary called uh, Pierce Flynn. And I suppose Pierce uh, has businesses in Scotland and has seen firsthand the revitalization of of um, of of marine areas like Spaberdeen and others with offshore wind. He's from, as I said, uh, Cork and you know, looking at the gap that existed in indigenous supply chain and the services that were going to be required and also to help kind of build social license in Ireland for the development of offshore winds, therein was the opportunity. So uh, we've built, uh, we've, we've mentioned, look, we've grown like a like a nettle, as they say here in Ireland. We've gone from a couple of people in a port cabin in late 2020 uh, to just approaching 100 people all in now uh, providing various services. Um, so, you know, it's not without its challenges. We, um, you know, when you grow that fast, you you learn to move quickly, uh, to to learn quickly, to fail quickly. Um, but nonetheless, I guess we're a metaphor for the industry. It requires speed and it requires agility. So um, we'd like to think that, you know, we're a, a first mover, you know, creating a path for others to follow. I think that's very important. Great. Well, sounds like it's been an exciting couple of years. It's uh, that that's great to hear. Um, now, just thinking about Ireland for a second, Kieran. Um, mm-hmm. There've been some big announcements from the Irish market um, over the last week, haven't there? There's some exciting um, moves. Being yeah, made. there is. Yeah. So the the first res auction in Ireland uh, happened uh, just a week before last, actually, and it was a a real positive step uh, in in Ireland's kind of pathway towards offshore renewable energy. Uh, like it's worth mentioning and to preface that, you know, there was a time when Ireland was a pioneer uh, when it comes to offshore wind energy. Like Ireland's first offshore wind farm was built in Arklow Bank, if I'm not wrong, a, a JV between um, a GE and Airtricity at the time. Um, I think it's got a, you know, a they were one of the first, um, I think they were the first wind farm to put a, a wind turbine that was producing three megawatts, you know, and that seems very small right now, but for its time, it certainly was innovation. But at that time, Ireland started focusing more on onshore wind. Um, and as of today, there's over 400 onshore wind farms producing something like installed capacity of 5.5 to 6.5 gigs. So it's that's where Ireland's focus was. And it was probably down to the cost of offshore versus onshore at that time. Um, right now, as of today, wind in Ireland generates one third of our overall energy needs, which is which is phenomenal. So acceptance of wind energy in Ireland is is very, very high. I think a recent study I heard at the Wind Energy Ireland conference or a recent report uh, or a poll uh, showed that 80 percent of Irish people are very much in favour of wind um, providing our future energy needs. And I think opposition, you know, absolute opposition is only at five percent. So. You know, I'd like to see and I hope to see that, you know, other markets where nimbyism has been quite pre- prevalent, you know, not in my backyard. You know, Ireland could present something different in a more a yimbyism. Yes, in my backyard. And, you know, Ireland hasn't been a quick mover at this. But what we have had is an opportunity to learn and see what works in other markets and and use that learning to really give us a strong foundation. So moving forward to to, to last week, as you said, um, you know, that process, some of those uh, six uh, developers that were looking to go through the res auction have been in the process for, gosh, 12 plus years, I think. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we now have something like 3.2 percent, uh, sorry, 3.2 gigs uh, committed. Uh, they are um, Statcraft uh, up in the north uh, Irish Sea. Uh, we have RWE, we have Corio Generation and we have a combination of Fred Olson and EDF on the Codling Bank. Um, so, you know, really good uh, first steps in. Um, and I think the most, you know, the most, the one that really gives a lot of attention for me is the is the site on the West Coast, the Scared Rock sites with Corio, because, you know, I don't know, have you seen uh, Ireland's Western Seaboard and the Atlantic Ocean? But if you can build something out there, you can build it anywhere. Um, and again, it, it, it takes some of the economic activity away from Ireland's east coast and puts it on the west coast. So I think all in that's been been really, really positive and subject to planning permission, which is the next phase they go through. We would hope that those sites would be um, operational and producing energy by 2032, uh, which would be you know fantastic. That is phase one in Ireland. Uh, that gets us some way to our own domestic uh, energy requirements, not the full way. Ireland's 2030, 2032 ambitions are around seven gigs, five gigs uh, around or for um, domestic use, and then a further two gigs for alternative offtake, probably hydrogen in this instance. Uh, So there will be a phase two res auction happening next year uh, where 
again, a lot of developers more on the south coast and east coast and some on the west coast will vie for uh, for more um, positive results. Uh, then Ireland moves into a very much a plan led approach, so a government led approach, uh, which is currently called the enduring regime. Uh, so over the coming years, we expect that the Irish government will go and begin mapping the seabed and, and looking at wind profiles and doing full ecology reports and bringing together all of the stakeholders that are required to give Ireland a strong foundation of data that will inform the, the DMAPs, the designated marine areas in which wind farms can be built. So I think we'll be moving to a full on auction state similar to Scotland and other markets. But um, look, you need to start with first steps and, uh, you know, it, it is very positive and you know, certainty gives investors like developers or even supply chain uh, confidence to invest in Ireland. So we're very much open for business. Right. Well, it sounds like uh, an exciting future, Kieran. Um, tell me, so for each of the four or five main areas you're involved in, mm -hmm. um, how far ahead of wind farm construction do you get involved? Yeah. Um, it varies. It varies market by market. I mean, typically the first out of the blocks is the baseline area of ecology surveys because that's a 24 month process. So it is flying an investigation area consecutively around the same time each month for 24 months. That gives a good variability on, you know, marine life and, and aerial bird life in those areas. So because of that lead time, typically that will start um, in advance. Um, then when we look at the marine side, you know, we typically will do some light touch investigation uh initially so um you know i mean there's still be significant large areas that we would survey um on the med ocean side again some markets go first on med ocean they want to quantify the wind resource uh, the lidar side before they go on auction sites others will leave it to developers so typically we find you know prior to uh, a a res piece it's a couple of years but then you're at the mercy of um planning permissions and judicial reviews and the bureaucracy that that, that entails but we're strong believers here at green rebel that you get the data right and you invest in the devx phase then you reduce the cost and the timelines later in the process uh but we're um i suppose the answer to your question Maria, in a very roundabout way it varies market to market that's what we're finding okay and thinking about markets you know you're obviously based in Ireland, but you're not a million miles yeah. away from the other, you know, from the UK markets. Yeah. Um, you, you you work in what Scotland and England and Wales regularly? Um, funnily enough, as of right now, we're working in all three jurisdictions, probably as I speak. So we're in the Isle of Man today with one of our vessels uh, doing survey where we have a large boy just deployed um, 70 kilometres off Peterhead in Scotland and we're running lines uh, on a site in uh, with our aerial ecology team down in Wales. So um, very similar, um, you know, processes, you know, like, as I said, like aerial ecology, the aerial techniques were kind of adopted and pioneered in the UK. There's still markets that are doing boat based techniques, literally people on boats looking up at birds blows my mind that 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 is a way to do it. But um Ireland and the UK will be quite similar. Some of the some of the differences we would find, particularly with the onset of Brexit, um, you know, you know, sector deals are, are very real within within Scotland. So having um, partnership or having um, you know offices in Scotland is particularly important. Now, fortunately, our parent company is a Scottish company, uh, but um, by and large, Moray, they're they're similar markets. Yeah, great. And just thinking about these boys, the LIDAR boys, you know, tell us a little mm -hmm. bit more about those. Those are looking at what, at um, weather conditions and current and so on. Is that right? Yeah, so so we built a, a boy. So currently the floating LIDAR platform. So if you think onshore, um, LIDARs have existed in terrestrial sense for, for many, many years. And they effectively will shoot a beam uh, 300 metres up in the air and that will give wind profile data over the course of 12 months or 24 months, depending on uh, what the developer or the consenting body is looking for. Um, the same premise will exist offshore, uh, but you need a platform on which to uh, deploy that LIDAR. So we developed the platform, which is a 12 and a half ton uh, piece of kit, which um, which has significant redundancy in it, because if you're deploying a buoy 70 kilometers offshore, if that goes down for any reason and you have a break in that data, you want to ensure that there is backup power. So our buoys are powered by wind, um, ironically. They're powered by battery and they're powered by solar. Um, then the 
the buoyancy of our boy is important as well because in those conditions, whether it's the west coast of Ireland or off Scotland, again, the waves can, can dip those boys into the water. Um, so the buoyancy is very, very important. So we've created a, a strong piece of engineering the the power that was emanating from that boy then gives us the ability to hang kind of water monitoring um, um, pieces of kit like ADCPs and and others uh, to measure to measure wave and to measure currents again data sets that are required given whether it's a fixed bottom or a, a floating uh, wind farm um, that data will be important so. Our boy went from initiation through to um, stage two certification on the Carbon Trust uh, roadmap into commercial viability in less than a year, uh, which is, I suppose, you know, it, it's a fair achievement. Um, and now it's commercially viable. And as I said, we've um, we're, we're beginning deploying them. Um, our boy as well, like it, it's we're looking at floating as uh, as the key here. The further when the real estate closer to land becomes lesser, then obviously wind farms are going to move further. So the need for better buoyancy, the need for better redundancy within those pieces of kit are, are ultra important. Sure. And and Kieran, the data on them, is that logged locally or is it communicated to shore or is it a little bit of both? No, it's it's available real time um, to the developers. So again, you know, technology is advancing, so it's got its own um, satellite access and it's pinging data in near real time. Um, some developers want that rate raw data and be able to see it in real time. Uh, others are happy to wait for us to interpret that data and give a monthly report. But um, across all of our operations, data availability um, as soon as possible is key. So even on our vessels, Murray, uh, with the onset of Starlink and other things, um, we can ping data and have people process that data on shore within minutes of it being acquired. Very cool. I'm, I'm conscious that a lot of our audience are, you know, interested in offshore renewables as a potential career path. Kieran, can mm. you tell me, you know, not everybody in Green Rebel are surveyors, right? You know, there must be lots of different disciplines within the business. Can you just talk a little bit to, to some of those, to some of the different types of people you've got in the team? Yeah, yeah. So sure. So as I said, like Green Rebel is like a mini, a mini conglomerate maybe at this point. And um, I suppose foundationally we've put in a, a team of uh, we call it our shared services team. So it's your your typical services that are required to run a business, your finance function, your HR function, your business development function, uh, your uh, IT function. So they're our shared resources and they take up about 20 percent of our headcount. So, you know, the, the, the clues and the name is on the tin, you know, it's a uh, that's what to do. I would say very few of that team have any experience in offshore wind um, and all are delighted to get into this industry because it's a really interesting industry. It's quite purposeful in how it's set up. Um, so that is kind of the foundation of our business. Then looking across. So you're right. Not everyone is offshore. We have about 25 of our 100 who operate offshore. Uh, the remaining are onshore. So there are GIS technicians, there are geophysicists, there are oceanographers, there are ornithologists, there are marine mammal observers, there are project management teams. Um, uh, so, yeah, look, we, we have a huge variety, um, a very young workforce, a very optimistic workforce. Um, and um, yeah, look, it's it's, um, you know, the people we have at Green Rebel, given our size, you know, we believe are quite big. And in the context of Ireland, we are quite big. But in an international setting our competition um, are, you know, some of them have higher headcounts in Ireland's entire supply chain. So that's who we're competing against. So. We do look to invest a bit in um, people, uh, a lot in people, a lot in culture. Um, you know, we as a company have adopted, you know, we won't be able to compete on salary. Uh, we won't be able to compete on other things that maybe the larger uh, companies can. Uh, so we've invested in, you know, four day work weeks. We've invested in uh, really training and enabling our employees um, to be the best they can be. And look, you see behind me, there's a building the next generation of, of industry leaders. I mean, that's very important to us. We're one of the first moving companies here in Ireland and nothing would give us more satisfaction than seeing people out on the floor here, you know, being the CEO of our rival competitor in 10 years time. But you have to have that mindset. We're a challenger brand and, um, you know, we, we can move, we can be more nimble and more flexible. So that gives us an advantage, particularly in our local market. Great. And, uh, you know, does Green Rebel invest in kind of school leavers, university leavers, armed forces leaders, apprentices, that sort of thing? 
Yeah, I mean, quite a few of our scientists are, are have come straight out of college. Um, we're lucky here in Cork, um, the relevant courses in the University College Cork, uh, the likes of geophysicists and GIS technicians, there is a direct pathway from them and we are working closely with that university in particular around our methodologies on how we process data and looking for that to be taught uh, within the university. So creating that pathway out of the university uh, into industry. Um, yeah, look, we, do, we do the usual. I mean, we, we have quite a lot of student placements over the last while. I think Ireland and collective thinking uh, with the universities, with the Maritime College in Ireland, which is also down here, it is about industry and, and those institutions working together. Um, but by and large, you know, for Ireland to move forward and like any other market, the resource challenges will be very, very prevalent. It's important that we recognise that now and begin to safeguard uh, the future. Uh, also, it's quite interesting from our perspective, um, you know, I'm from a fishing community, our founder and many of our crew are from fishing communities, and there's a lot of opportunity for, um, for, for people who currently work in the fishing industry to diversify, whether full-time or at a project level, to take advantage of the work that's coming. You know, it's, it's great having, you know, maybe some of the best scientists, but unless they have sea legs and can be out and out in rough conditions, then it's very difficult. So it's getting a really good combination of really salty dogs, as well as um, some of the brightest minds. Brilliant. And, you know, why does offshore wind matter? Oh, gosh, uh, it's a very profound question, Murray. Uh, well, offshore wind matters, I suppose, you know, we look at the triple the triple benefit, and I know this has been mentioned on previous uh, podcasts as well, but the whole decarbonisation piece is, is ultra important. And, um, you know, I'm very, I'm very bought into the environmental benefits of offshore wind. You know, people tend to focus on the damage to fishing and people tend to focus on the damage to ecology. But I believe in balance and I believe that, actually the biggest threat to both of those institutions is climate change. And, you know, offshore wind is one of those, um, I suppose, really important initiatives for Ireland and other countries to embrace to help tackle that. So for sure, the climate change piece is is, is massive. Um, the second piece, and can I, I know it's been mentioned ad nauseum, it's, it's energy security and it's energy in, in independence. Because, you know, think about where Ireland is and not dissimilar to the UK, we're on the periphery of Europe. And traditionally, energy has come from Russia and has come from Germany and has come from basically east to west. And the opportunity for us now is to take energy from from west to east and be a net exporter of our energy. So it's it's hugely important to both of our economies that that is recognised and that we can move fast because others will take our lunch. Uh, we've no question at a, at, a, at a country level. And um, the third piece, and maybe the one that maybe most I suppose appeals to me being in business is the economic opportunity, the opportunity for, you know, job creation, the opportunity for reinvigoration of our coastal communities, the opportunity for, you know, critical infrastructure improvements and ports and harbours around Ireland. You know, there is in Ireland strong concentration of um, of talent, of, of jobs in the hubs in Cork and in Dublin and in our cities. So if we can spread that out, I mean, I'm a country boy, but I also had to move uh, to a city to to start my career. So um, I think that triple benefit is 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 very compelling. And that's why offshore wind matters uh, so much uh, to Ireland's prospects. You know, Ireland has Ireland has invested heavily in big tech, in pharma, in tourism. We need to diversify, uh, you know, our, and our fiscal policies need to match that. So um, offshore wind presents a once in a lifetime opportunity. Brilliant. And, you know, Green Rebel is quite a young and it seems innovative business. Um, sure. You know, why is innovation so important to you? Um. Well, innovation should be important to every business because the world moves quickly. You know, it's, uh, you know, I, 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 having looked at this industry and when I got into this industry, you know, even now offshore wind is very reliant on the conventions of oil and gas. So when it comes to geophysical survey, it's, you know, get a big vessel and fill it up with people and, you know, off you go for 10, 12 days at a time. But it need not be that way. You know, I mean, there is technology when you consider Uber um, and what it did to um, the, the the taxi cab drivers in London. It just it just changed the game, and that's where technology really plays a part. So, um, you know, innovation and not standing still is critically important. So, what we're looking at across Green Rebel, and it's not just 
internal innovation because internal innovation is very important it's, it's not seen but it's improving our processes it's improving the speed at which we do we base it on very simple principles and that is how can we deliver better data faster to our clients you know we did a big project last year in going to our clients talking to them finding out what's important to them and it's very simple it's better data faster and it shouldn't matter how data is acquired once data is acquired um, in the most ethical way possible uh, that it is compliant with health and safety and environmental standards. What we need to see is that data is the product and how that's acquired isn't the isn't isn't the challenge, if that makes sense. So we're looking at drone technologies. We're, we're kicking off a project right now on aerial with drones. Uh, we're looking at um, I mean, our, our innovation on Med Ocean is um, is um, is there already, but we're not going to rest on our laurels with that because others will catch up. It's just the nature of um, of, of things. So um, innovation is part of our values and it's it's a big part of our daily operations. Right. And the offshore wind developers, are they kind of ready adopters of innovation? Um, we see a mixed a mixed view on that. I mean, um, I'd probably relate it to a developer's risk profile, Murray, if I'm honest. You know, the larger developers are are more likely to, uh, even within tender, score innovation as a, as a as a reason to to choose a particular supplier. Um, you know, I've I've seen many large developers, you know, investing in innovation, so they have funds available to to push forward. So at that level. Um, very, very supportive. I guess maybe where we have developers working closely with consultants or, um, you know, someone needs to justify the selection of a vessel and someone needs to justify their role in the selection of a plane. So I think it just feeds back to my earlier point. If, if we as an industry can focus on the output, then it gives license to the supply chain to look at different ways of doing things. I think, you know, Rebel is in our name. It gives provenance because we're based in Cork and Cork is the Rebel County. But we use Rebel as a way to say, look, we need to disrupt the convention. And a lot of what we do is quite conventional right now, but we have the benefit of having data acquired in a conventional sense, then demonstrating that this way is equal, if not better in, 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 a, in its application. Um, you know, proving it to developers is probably um, is a big challenge for us and consenting bodies because, you know, a consenting body also is a stakeholder here. And, um, you know, very often they like the same things appearing on their desk. So, uh, but notwithstanding, Maureen, you'll be well aware of this. You know, the more ambition that's happening in Europe, the more ambition for countries, there is going to be a shortage of vessels, a shortage of uh, of key um, of key items to do this type of work. So I think innovation, uh, like many things, will solve a lot of the problems that's coming up as well. Yeah, it is going to be really interesting, isn't it, how uh, adjacent markets like the UK and Ireland deliver product, mm. sorry, deliver projects when they're actually going to be competing for people and vessels and you know, yeah. different technologies. So I guess we I have agree. to do I things mean, differently, right? I do agree. And and I, I'm maybe focusing more on our business, but when it comes to innovation and when it comes to those two markets, Scotland and Ireland, the real innovation and the real opportunity for those countries is within floating offshore wind. There is absolutely no question of that. You know, both of our profiles of wind mirror and water depths mirror to that opportunity like the as I said the west coast of Ireland have you been there Maury I mean it is wild oh, but rather than yeah. rather than look at that as a challenge you have to look at that as a basin for innovation it's our opportunity and if we can do that if we can build um, floating offshore on the west coast we can build it anywhere in the world and therein is our economic opportunity to export our IP and export our talent so I'd love to see really good collaboration between Scotland and Ireland I mean culturally we're quite aligned um, certainly um, having been up and down to Scotland and talking to a number of supply chain companies up there you know they're happy to support us up there we're happy to support them in Ireland but again I know you've covered floating off uh, previous in previous podcasts but this is um, this is our opportunity for sure. Right. And, you know, would you do you have a specific call to those developers? How do we um, encourage them to uh, to accept more innovation? Um, it was like that. Is it a carrot and is it a stick? You know, um, you know I, I definitely think that um, 
you can either do it at a, at a contract level and ensure that it's scored within a contract. But again, that's already happens within the more, I suppose, risk accepting uh, developers, but maybe at a, at a market level, at a government level to encourage innovation and to encourage new ways of doing things. Is that the carrot and the stick is actually to score it in their um, their res applications? Um, so, you know, ultimately, um, data is the product. And I think when there's widespread acceptance of that, I think that is that is the way forward. So they should uh, focus on data as the product and allow you to worry about how they get the data, right? It's not, I mean, as long as it's done ethically, as long as it's done to the highest standards, both environmentally and from a sustainability perspective, but there really shouldn't be, um, we're too wedded on convention is, is my view and the view of my colleagues here. Great. Now, um, you mentioned that um, Green Rebel has a parent in Scotland. That's interesting. Um, it's it's overall a group of companies, isn't it? Yeah, so our founder is a chap uh, by the name of Pierce Lynn. He's uh, from East Cork, actually down here in Ireland. So uh, he's got a long, illustrious um, back catalogue of business successes, including um, ownership of Celtic Football Club for a while, um, Livingston Football Club for a while. Uh, but I suppose... You know, he's got things like 13 companies uh, right now. Um, his green portfolio is here in Ireland. So there's Green Rebel and there's another company called um, Action Zero. So they do uh, heat pumps uh, technologies for large industries. Um, so, yeah, so we're kind of we're fairly well connected as a group of companies. And even today, you know, we still have people in Scotland who support the business. Um, you know, I. Uh, Pierce, uh, as a as a leader, I mean, he's as I said, a green investor. He's he's someone who's never taken the conventional path, and they often say a company is a reflection of their leader. Um, so that's very similar here at Green Rebel, but very um, I suppose it, very visionary in what he wants to achieve for sure. Great. Um, now, Kieran, I'd like to find out a little bit more about you. Can you just take us through your career, please? Yeah, uh, how long do we have, Murray? Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I'm a college dropout. Um, I initially studied um, food science, and that didn't work for me. So I dropped out of that and served my time as a carpenter. Uh, so. I'm well used to hard work and cold scaffolding bars in the morning and, um, you know, physically demanding work. Um, look, my dad uh, also worked in that industry, said, look, you have a choice here. You can either stick at it or uh, go to college and at least get a degree and fall back on something. So that's what I did. I got a marketing degree um, and very quickly started working in um, Ad, Ad World, an ad agency in Dublin. Um, incredibly you know from a communications perspective i think marketing as a as a as a as a as a discipline is so um is so good it, it covers so many bases so in that time i worked quite a lot with the department of the environment here in ireland uh worked on uh, campaigns like change.ie and power of one so they were back in 2007 2008 very much ahead of their time warning that it's going to get worse so i look back at 14 15 years ago and go we've been on about this for so long now so um, <clears throat> I worked there. I worked with other large utilities in that time. I then moved into a, a large bank in Ireland, Ulster Bank, part of RBS Group, and very quickly figured that this isn't for me. Large companies being a number, um, very much more suited to smaller companies. So I moved to a large data company here in Cork, uh, a, a internal communication software company, uh, big data selling selling product to some of the largest companies in the world. And there we really got a sense of how to handle data, uh, how to manage data and how to do business with literally global companies. Um, because it's good, it's it's one thing to have assets, it's one thing to have a great idea, but doing business and the expectation of large global companies is is a whole different ballgame. And then that company was acquired last year, uh, sorry, two years ago by a, a, a large American VC. So the opportunity came up in Green Rebel. Uh, at that point, Green Rebel was just going through its competency phase and looking to build a business development function. So again, taking my learnings on data, taking my learnings on doing business with large multinational companies and applying them to the marine environment. Um, I wouldn't say it's been relatively seamless, but certainly it's a learning that you don't necessarily need to have background in this industry to be able to impact this industry. And feeding back to your innovation point earlier, if you if you if you'll indulge me, you know we're seeing quite a lot of layoffs in Ireland now in the tech industry, but tech 
and ideas in tech and letting robots and AI replace some of the processes, there's opportunity in this industry as well. So if anything, I'm testament to the fact that no experience required. And, you know, uh, as long as I can enable the people who know what they're doing to do what they do best, then my job is done. Brilliant. Um, and Kieran, um, I'd like to turn to success, if I might. Um, sure. What do businesses in offshore wind need for success? Yeah. Um, uh, speaking from our side, it's 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 really it's certainty, you know. Um, so in the Irish context, we've gone through a period of we didn't quite know uh, where we're going as an industry, um, and that impacts, you know, from a developer's perspective, investment from developers. And if developers aren't investing and spending money, if there's no certainty, like they'll just spend in another market, and and where there is certainty, and spread their risk elsewhere. So that has a downstream impact on supply chain and companies like us. Similarly, where we have certainty, you know, going to my um, shareholders and going to my investors and looking for a fourth vessel and a fifth vessel. As long as I have certainty in a strong pipeline, then uh, that's that's what we need, you know. So. I would say that, uh, you know, at times we've been guilty uh, in our in an Irish context of it's better to make no decision than the wrong decision. And we need to change that because, again, you know, mistakes will happen. Policy and regulatory frameworks will be imperfect, uh, but you need to accept that to move forward. So I suppose a one word answer, but a long way of explaining it is uh, certainty, Murray. Good, good to hear. And, um, you know, Kieran, you're, you're, you're chief executive of the Green Rebel Group. Um, sure. How do you define success for the group? Uh, well, there's there's one obvious answer, and that's revenue. Uh, that's um, that's key. That's key that we will look to. You know, we're investing in our growth here. Uh, so anything that we make a green rebel will be reinvested. So growing the company and taking on more projects. Uh, you know, last year we achieved north of twelve million euro in one contracts. Um, Every single cent of that, Murray, would have been spent outside of Ireland if Green Rebel did not exist. And continuing to build on that and providing inspiration to other entrepreneurs in Ireland to follow the path that we've gone down. And again, we've made plenty of mistakes and are happy to share uh, those mistakes as we go down. But, you know, we've learned fast and we fail fast. You know, one of the things that's very important to me, and it's very important to me because it's kind of a pay it forward. I've been very lucky in my career to have managers that have really managed me well and given me every opportunity. So again, the the, the piece behind me about creating the next generation of industry leaders is a real indicator of success. You wouldn't do that if uh, if you were um, if you weren't successful in the first instance, you know. Right. And and you know, in your own personal life, how do you define your own success, Kieran? Um. I'm very simple. I'm a very simple person and I have three young kids at home. And as long as as they're happy and I'm happy, as long as I'm coming to work every day and it doesn't feel like a drudge, you know, just Sunday night fear. I, I'm fortunate to say I haven't experienced that in a long, long time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when you're successful, then other things, other good things will follow. But um, for me, what drives me internally is is my family uh, but equally this industry presents so much opportunity for my three kids you know uh, so it's 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 uh, that's quite important brilliant um Kieran um I know you're familiar with this um in each of our episodes we ask uh, our guests to set a question for our next guest without knowing who it's going to be um and in the last episode we met Davis Larson the chief executive officer at proserve and Davis set this question for you, Kieran. Sure. How do you ensure that the decisions you take today will be reflected positively in 15 to 20 years time by the market, our children and the environment as a whole? Yeah, uh, so a bit of time to think about this one. Um, I suppose the it, it feeds back to, again, perfection is, is the enemy of the good and don't strive for perfection. So, you know, at a policy level, um, it's important for us to recognise that, you know, nothing is going to be perfect and you can't bake a cake without breaking a few eggs. And ultimately, all of this is for the greater good. I think it's important for our officials and for our politicians to ensure that the greater good is represented. You know, as I said it earlier, you know, 80 percent of Irish people are very much in favour of wind uh, meeting our energy requirements. So it's taking that on board and I suppose driving on, as they say here in Ireland. Um, also, it's very important that data that data leads decisions. And in the absence of data, 
um, you know, mistakes will happen. So Ireland is fortunate, actually, that we've been slow to the party because we're going to invest heavily in getting the data right and let those database decisions, you know, actually expedite the process uh, later as we move through the the the, uh, the, the planning permission phase. Um, I was very encouraged to see this week a wind farm in the North Sea. Um, I think it was off the Netherlands where turbines are actually being switched off to uh, for migratory birds to run through the wind farm, you know, but that's a product of data. And that shows that coexistence between environmental and offshore wind can happen where data is used to guide the future of what we do. So uh, that's my response. Great. Thank you, Karen. And, um, you know, ahead of uh, recording with you today, I asked you to leave a question for our next guest. Um, yeah. Can, can you let us have it? I've well, written down here, but uh, full disclosure, Murray, right? Um, I, I, I think that um, anyone who gets this question, it's like, how do I sound, sound really intelligent and how do I sound, you know, that uh, I really thought this one out. So in the spirit of what I talk about innovation and in the spirit of um of, of, of AI, um, I've actually let uh, ChatGPT ask this question, uh, if that's okay. So um, I, I typed in, uh, what, write a profound question about the future of offshore renewables. And ChatGPT gave me, what groundbreaking advancements and visionary strategies will shape the future of offshore renewables, propelling us to a world where clean, abundant energy meets the vast potential of our oceans? I could not have written that better myself. <laughs> well, it's cheating, but I like it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> look, let, let let technology lead, Murray. That's what I'm saying. Absolutely. Great. Well, look, Kieran, you know, that brings us to the end of our podcast today. But thank you for uh, for, for joining um, just so, you know, Kieran Ivers, Chief Executive Officer of Green Rebel Group um, over in Cork. Thank you for joining us today. You've been a great guest. A pleasure, Murray. Thank you. Now, as always, feedback on today's podcast is um, very welcome. Um, give ideas of who we should feature, uh, what questions we should be asking, and uh, and anything else. You know, a lot of you get in touch through LinkedIn. Please carry on doing that, or of course by email. It's Murray. That's M O R A Y at Annet A N N E T Consulting dot com. Thank you very much. <laughs>